This presentation is on maturation ponds, and these are the third type of pond that we commonly use. We use ponds in series because different pond types have different functions. BOD removal is good in anaerobic and facultative ponds, but poor in maturation ponds, which tend to be used for the removal of faecal bacteria and other excreted pathogens. We know from theory, and we can observe this in practice as well, that a series of small ponds outperforms a single pond of the same overall size. So we have either Series A shown on the slide or Series B, and there's a preference for Series A as BOD removal in anaerobic ponds is so good. The size and number of maturation ponds depends on the final effluent quality we need to produce, and for maximal performance the maturation pond should all be the same size. This may not of course be possible, but at this the process stage of the design we assume that it is. We normally design maturation ponds for E. coli removal, although of course we might in any one case want to design them for something else, nitrogen removal for instance. We use the design method developed by the late Professor Marais. The first equation on the slide is the usual first order equation for, in this case, E. coli removal in a completely mixed reactor. And the second equation is Marais' empirical equation for the variation of the first order rate constant for E. coli removal, Kb, with temperature, and its value is strongly temperature dependent changing by 19% for every 1 degree C change in temperature. So for a series of ponds, and remembering that the effluent of one pond is the influent to the next, we can derive the equation for NE shown on the slide. This basically says that NE, the number of E. coli per 100 mL of the final effluent, equals NI, the number per 100 mL of the raw wastewater, divided by a term for the anaerobic pond, by one for the facultative pond, and by one for the maturation ponds raised to the power n, where n is the number of maturation ponds. Now ni is either known or taken as, for example, 5 times 10 to the 7 per 100 mil. Ne is known, as it's the final effluent quality we need, and at this stage in the design, we will have already designed the anaerobic and facultative ponds, so the retention times in these, theta an and theta fac, are also known. So we have one equation with two unknowns, we can solve it either by trial and error, or, and this is better, by calculating the value of theta mat for n equals 1, and then for n equals 2, and so on, until theta mat is less than theta mat min, the minimum value of theta mat. A minimum value of theta mat is used in order to minimise hydraulic short-circuiting and to allow sufficient time for the algae to multiply. Theta mat min has a value in the range 3 to 5 days, generally 3 days in hot climates, and five days in temperate climates. So when we solve the equation for n equals 1, n equals 2, and so on, we might get the following results. For n equals 1, theta mat equals 150 days. For n equals 2, theta mat equals 20 days. For n equals 3, theta mat equals 4.2 days. And for n equals 4, theta mat equals 1.6 days. We would stop here as the last calculated value of theta mat is less than theta mat min. So how do we interpret these results? Well, we would ignore values of theta mat greater than theta fac. There's no theoretical basis for this, just engineering judgment. And we would obviously ignore values of theta mat less than theta mat min. We then choose the combination of n and theta mat that requires the least land. That is to say, the combination for which the product n theta mat is a minimum and we would include in this comparison the combination of theta mat min and the value of n for which the value of theta mat first goes below theta mat min. Thus theta mat can't be greater than theta fac, nor less than theta mat min. But we should also consider a BOD loading constraint. Clearly, the BOD loading on the first maturation pond can't be greater than that on the preceding facultative pond, and it's better if it's quite a bit less than this and I prefer to say that the loading on M1 can't be more than 75% of the FAC pond loading. To calculate lambda S M1, we first determine the effluent BOD from the facultative pond by using the first order equation for unfiltered BOD removal with K1 equals 0.1 day to the minus 1, or if it's a primary FAC pond, with K1 equals 0.3 day to the minus 1. In fact, it's best to consider this loading constraint first, and using the equation on the slide, determine the minimum value of theta m1, 
and then follow the four-step procedure, which I'll now describe. The first step is the calculation of theta m1 min using the loading equation we've just derived. Step two is to calculate the retention time in the second and subsequent maturation ponds using the equation we had before, but now, as shown in the slide, with the term for m1. We solve this equation for n equals 1, then for n equals 2, and so on, until theta mat is less than theta mat min. Note that n is now the number of the second and subsequent maturation ponds. It does not include m1. Step 3 is the selection of the most appropriate combination of theta mat and n, including theta mat min and enye, where enye is the value of n for which theta mat first goes below theta mat min. Step 4 is the calculation of the maturation pond areas, taking net evaporation into account. With facultative ponds, we had the first equation shown on the slide, and for maturation ponds, we need to rearrange this equation in terms of A, in fact AM, as shown in the second equation on the slide. Now a word on design temperatures. For anaerobic and facultative ponds, we have to use the mean temperature of the coldest month, as the ponds have to function properly at this lowest mean monthly temperature. With maturation ponds, it's less straightforward. If we were designing them for nitrogen removal, then we'd have to use the mean temperature of the coldest month. But if we're designing them to produce an effluent suitable for agricultural reuse, then we'd use the mean temperature of the coldest month in the irrigation season. Going back to the design equation for E. coli removal in a series of ponds, it has to be asked whether we should use the same value of Kb in all three types of pond. The answer is probably not, but we don't have too much data to say one way or the other, at least with any degree of confidence. But we do know that the equation is perfectly OK for a whole series of ponds, rather than for individual anaerobic facultative or maturation ponds. In facultative ponds, the value of Kb seems to be a function of the BOD loading on the pond, as well as of time and temperature. As shown in this slide, for a primary facultative pond in northeast Brazil, which had a mean in-pond temperature of around 25 degrees C. The value of Kb decreased fairly linearly, with BOD loading in the range 200 to 400 kilos per hectare per day. Thereafter, it remained essentially constant. This slide shows the performance of a series of five ponds in northeast Brazil in the late 1970s. The anaerobic pond had a retention time of nearly a week, much too long really, and the facultative and the three maturation ponds had retention times of about five and a half days. Most of the BOD and suspended solids were removed as would be expected in the anaerobic pond, and the suspended solids actually increased in the facultative pond due to the growth of the algae. But the truly remarkable performance of the series is the removal of faecal coliform bacteria, more or less by an order of magnitude in each pond, down to 30 per 100 mil in the final effluent, a better bacteriological quality than the water most people in developing countries have to drink. But the real point of results like these is that you can design a pond system to do more or less whatever you want. Pond systems are flexible. 